This is rural England, ancient land, wondrous land, teeming with history and tradition. For centuries, it has generously given forth its manna of life to the generations that have cultivated it. And today, it continues to yield its effulgent harvest to the larders of mankind. During the recent war, the farmers of Great Britain were called upon to do their utmost toward making their country self-sustaining. And as a result of their superhuman efforts, the amount of food supplies formerly imported from abroad were cut from 50% to the present amount of less than one-third of the total food consumed by the country. In order to make this possible, large and small estates were broken up into farmland and all the resources of the soil were mobilized. Women and children worked in the fields with the men, for here, sturdy patriotism, independence, self-sufficiency, and a strong sense of duty are outstanding characteristics of the people. Even grandmother does her bit. During the past 10 years, the amount of plowed land in England alone was increased from about two million to approximately eight million acres. Aided by the government, the farmers kept alive all the old traditions of British skill and experience in tilling even the most unpromising soil, so that today Britain has increased its agricultural resources beyond the bounds of pre-war reasoning, and her people realize and appreciate, as never before, the natural wealth that lies in their land. Nurtured by time and tradition, the country villages and rustic towns seem to blend into the topography of the surrounding country. Here at Bradford-on-Avon, in southwestern England, life is quiet and simple, and contentment is easily attained. In North America, a house that has weathered a century of time is often regarded as a tourist attraction. But in England, it is not unusual to find houses that have been standing for hundreds of years and are still being occupied by the descendants of the original families that built them. For a rustic beauty and charm, nothing in English architecture has yet surpassed the quaint old thatch-roofed cottages. And although ye old time thatchers have declined in numbers, their craftsmanship is still in great demand throughout the rural districts. As a tree reveals its age by its circles, a thatch roof cottage does likewise by its layers of thatch, as it is customary to cover an old layer with a new layer rather than replace it. A good covering of thatch will last 20 years, and some old cottages have roofs four or five feet thick. Buying with the thatcher in traditional popularity, is the village blacksmith, who still perpetuates his ancient and honorable trade. In sections where there are many small farms and the horse has not yet been supplanted by modern machinery, the blacksmith's forge is seldom idle. We are informed that this humble little epic of private enterprise is represented by three generations, father and son and grandfather. The cattle here are favored with lush and green pastures for grazing in all seasons, and they are noted for their unusually rich milk and beef. Along the main highways in England, a unique plan of direction applies to the telephone poles, the cross beams of which always appear on the side of the pole nearest to London, so that a motorist can tell whether he is traveling toward or away from the largest city in the world. Occupying selected sites on principal roads all over the country are the Automobile Association telephone boxes. They can be opened by a special key issued to members who are entitled to make local calls free of charge. The telephone boxes are also the key points of the association's communication system, 
and by this means, urgent messages can be delivered to members on the road. These boxes are illuminated at night and contain particulars concerning the nearest hotels, garages, doctors, and ambulances. And now we visit one of the most famous churchyards in all of England, the old church and graveyard at Stoke Poges, where Thomas Gray was inspired to write his immortal elegy, and where the poet himself was laid to rest in the year of 1771. The death of Gray's dearest friend is said to have inspired him to write the famous elegy, from which we quote, The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, awaits alike the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. The poet concluded his immortal masterpiece with this verse for his own epitaph. Large was his bounty and his soul sincere. Heaven did a recompense as largely send. He gave to misery all he had, a tear. He gained from heaven, t'was all he wished, a friend. About 50 miles from this old graveyard, there is another famous cemetery, only recently created, where the muffled drum sad roll has beat the soldier's last tattoo. No more on life's parade shall meet that brave and fallen few. Rest on, embalmed and sainted dead, dear as the blood you gave. No impious footsteps here shall tread the herbage of your grave. Nor shall your glory be forgot while fame her record keeps. Our honored points the hallowed spot where valor proudly sleeps. Summer storms in England often fill the sky with spectacular cloud formations, such as we see here. But storms and sensational cloud formations are not so much of a joy to the farmer, who knows too well what a sudden downpour can do to a crop of uncleared grain. In the factual scheme of things, there are only a few inches of fertile soil between man and utter starvation. And if one world harvest should fail completely, life itself would fail. So let us give thanks to the creator of the soil and to the farmers the world over, upon whom we all must depend for the real necessities of life. And it is with this thought that we now conclude our pastoral panoramas of England.